Thank you so much, Merwin. Hi, everyone. Is it good to be back? I can't tell you how good it is to see your faces, all of them, from the littlest to the not littlest. Um, welcome, welcome. There's something so wonderful about being together to worship in God's house together, right? We were blessed. We were blessed to be able to do our live stream. We we're blessed to have people in our congregation who know all the techie side to make that happen. And those messages blessed us from Sabbath to Sabbath. But there's an extra special blessing when we come into God's presence together. So a warm welcome to you all. And a welcome to our online audience. We're glad to have you with us. Please join us again from week to week. I was six years old when my mother was baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And after she was baptized, I began to notice that there were certain things in our home that were different. Elder Dennis Parks shared a powerful story in Sabbath School today about a man whose life was transformed and changed when he let Jesus into his life and things started to change in our home and in my mom's life as, as well. And one of the things, and it, it, it may seem like a little thing, but trust me, to us little kids, it wasn't a little thing. Um, we, we were born and raised in the, in the British colony of Rhodesia and my mother to this day is a dedicated tea drinker. And so when she became a Seventh-day Adventist, she put away her regular tea and she started to drink a herbal tea called rooibos, which is now, it, it only grows in South Africa and the, at that time and now it, it's like one of the, the best ones that you can get. But back in those days, we hated it. And she really, it was important to her that we start to drink things that were good for our bodies. And so, you know that, that old saying, if you can't beat them, bribe them? She would bribe us. All right, I know you don't like it, but I will give you 10 cents if you will drink this cup of tea. And we really wanted the 10 cents because you could buy a lot for 10 cents in those days. And so we would drink the tea. And after a while, we forgot to ask her for the 10 cents, and she did not remind us. <laughs> and before we knew it, we had gotten used to this tea, of the rooibos tea, and, and so um, we were okay with it. She stopped smoking. Where just a few years before, when she was pregnant with me, she was smoking the strongest cigarette on the market, a pack and a half a day. She stopped smoking. We started to have worship, family worship, in our home. I saw her praying. I saw her slipping into her bedroom and kneeling by the side of her bed, and I saw her praying. And we went to Sabbath school and to church every single Sabbath. She never learned to drive. She, she still doesn't drive. But she found a way for us to get to church every Sabbath, all five of us. She my and her four little girls. We were in Sabbath school on time every Sabbath. She just really seemed to love Jesus. And she wanted us to get to know Jesus too. I was 12 years old, I remember, and it was a cold winter's day. It was a Sabbath afternoon. And I was walking around the house just bored to death. And I remember saying to her, Mom, what can I do? I'm so bored. It's Sabbath and I don't know what to do. And she looked at me and she said to me, Karen, why don't you read the old, old story? And I looked at her and she handed me her copy of The Desire of Ages. And she said to me, why don't you read the old, old story about Jesus and his love? And I took that book from her and I curled up on the sofa in front of the fireplace and I spent that afternoon reading and I fell in love with the old, old story. I fell in love 
with the desire of the ages. And I, I think I shared with you the last time I spoke that I've made a commitment to pick up this book again this year and to spend time in it every single day. Because you know, something happens to us. Something happens to us when we ponder, when we meditate, when we spend time, when we think about Jesus and his love. And as you know, you don't have to spend much time in this book before you find yourself Oh, my Bible's on the back seat. Before you find yourself in God's word, right? This draws you immediately into God's word. Thank you so much, Sherm. How I left it there, I don't know. I appreciate that. And so as I spend time this year looking at the old, old story, I find myself being drawn again and again to go back to the original old, older story of Jesus and his love. The story of the Father's heart of love and the Holy Spirit and their unmatched, unparalleled love for me, for you. And you cannot spend time at Jesus' feet or in his word calling on his name without it changing you, without being changed. Why else do you think it is that the enemy of souls works so hard to keep us distracted, to keep us away from God to pull us out of and draw us away from the place of prayer, to discourage us, to make us doubt that we will ever change. I remember going through long seasons, I'm not sure why this is popping, I apologize for it, to go through long seasons in my life where I would kneel down by the side of my bed at the end of the day, every day, and all I would feel was discouragement because I blew it again, Lord. Anyone else ever walk that walk? Lord, I've done it again. I blew it again. Is it any wonder why the enemy of souls works so hard to make us doubt that we will ever change, that we're always going to just keep messing up? Do you know what the trouble with doubt is? Please don't miss this, this is important. The trouble with doubt is that we, if we allow ourselves to keep doubting God's work in our lives, God's power in our lives, if we never take that doubt and acknowledge that it's there and admit to it, if we never take that doubt and examine it under the microscope of prayer and God's word, if we never work through our doubts, and is it wrong to doubt? No, it's part of how we grow if we allow that to happen. But if we never allow that to happen, if we never work through that place of doubting, we will eventually get to a place where we harbor a spirit of unbelief. Is it possible is it possible, family, for God's children to harbor a spirit of doubt and unbelief? Think about, when I think of that question, a couple of stories pop into my mind immediately. And one of the first of them is found in Matthew 8 verses 25 and 26. The disciples, 13 men, Jesus plus the 12 are on a boat and Jesus is fast asleep in the boat because he's exhausted and he has spent of himself all day and he is asleep. And a storm comes up and these strong, they were not wimps, they were strong men, physically active, and they were working with every energy to bail that water out of the boat to keep the boat from sinking. But the, water was take, the boat was taking on more water than they could bail out, and they knew that they were going to die. And when they cried out on the name of Jesus, O oh Lord, save us. 
but we perish. He said unto them, Why are you so fearful? O ye of little faith, little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. A little while later, they were on the boat again. Jesus was not with them, but they saw him walking across, walking on the water, walking across toward them, and they were terrified. And Peter, my precious Peter, says, Lord, if it's you, then bid me come to you. And Jesus said, come. Come, Peter. And Peter didn't hesitate. He stepped out on that boat and he walked on water to Jesus. And as he got closer, he started to notice the wind and the waves and what did happen to Peter's heart. In that moment of crisis, he experienced a lack of belief. He experienced doubt, and like a stone, he started to sink into the depths of the sea. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Often we don't think of that kind of prayer being prayed in Jesus' name, but that is the essence of what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, save me. Three words, the most powerful, most eloquent prayer is a prayer of desperation. Lord, save me. And Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore, why did you doubt? I was right here, but you let doubt and unbelief creep into your heart, and you started to sink. I want us to spend some time now in another story, in this word. And this story is told um, in three of the Gospels, and we're going to go back and forth between Matthew's telling of the story and John's telling of the story. And it's wonderful that we are able to do this because they each have a different perspective and they each tell something that the other doesn't tell that gives us a more complete picture of what happened at that moment in time. So the disciples... Um, had had this incredible experience. Jesus had taken Peter, James, and John up to the top of the mountain, and there they experienced the transfiguration, which was a powerful experience for them. But how, did you th how do you think the nine disciples who were not invited to go up the mountain with Jesus, how were they feeling about that? They were not happy. They were mad. That's exactly right. They were upset. They were a little bitter, a little resentful. What's so special about those three, anyway? And as they are waiting at the bottom of the mountain, who comes along? A father comes along with his son who is demon-possessed and has been demon-possessed for many, many years. And the the father says to the disciples, from whom he expects a great deal because they walk with Jesus, please, can you help my son? The disciples try. Are they able to cast out the demon? No, they're not. And around the bottom of the mountain with them, there's a crowd of people including some of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, who were absolutely delighted to see the disciples' failure. And they stood on the sidelines, laughing and criticizing and being mean-spirited, which made those nine disciples feel even worse. When Jesus came down with Peter, James, and John, they were met by chaos. This was the man's only son. He was precious to him. Luke tells us that. 
Jesus took in the scene immediately. He looked at the downcast faces of the nine disciples. And please remember that before this time, Jesus had sent them out and had given them power to cast out demons. So these men had already done this thing, right? They had done it. They had experienced God's power at work in them and through them. But something hadn't worked that day. For some reason, they had no power. So eventually the father comes and he says, again, he prays in Jesus' name and he says, Lord, help my son. Jesus, in all of the stories of casting out demons, we have instances where Jesus silenced the demon. We have stories where Jesus cast demons out immediately because he didn't want to give them any airtime, right? And draw attention to Satan's power. But Jesus does not do that in this story. He does something different. So everyone is so used to when someone is, is possessed with a demon and they bring him to Jesus, Jesus casts the demon out right away. But this time, Jesus turns to the father and he says, oh, well, why don't you bring the boy to me? So the father has to turn around and go and get the son, and he brings the son to Jesus. And Jesus stands there watching and waiting. And he gives the demon a chance to demonstrate his power. And what does he do? He throws the boy down into the dust and he's screaming and he's foaming at the mouth. And then as if to prolong this whole story, Jesus starts talking to the father. And he says to him, so how long has this been going on? Did Jesus need to know that to cast out the demon? No, he didn't need to know that. Jesus saw a bigger problem than a demon-possessed boy. Jesus saw a level of healing that needed to happen in all of those standing around. And he wondered if they would see it too. And so he waited to see if anyone would connect the dots to what was really happening. The father starts to tell this painful story of how for many years his son has struggled with these demons. And eventually, with, with absolute frustration, he bursts out and he, he finally says, Lord, if you are able to do anything, would you please do it? What is taking you so long? And Jesus said, if you can, if you can. All sentences that begin with if indicate that there is a spirit of unbelief present. Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. If you do not believe, you are unbelieving. Are you seriously asking me if I can do this? I can do all things. If only you would be willing to believe. And when Jesus said those words, the Father finally understood what Jesus was getting at. And he cried out, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Belief doesn't mean that we know exactly how Jesus is going to do it. But it means we know Jesus will do it because he has said it. We don't need to understand the how we just need to accept that he can, that he is longing to. But he wants us to see when we are harboring a spirit 
of unbelief. The story ends well for the boy. The demon is cast out. His father takes him home. And he lives a happy, healthy life because of Jesus. How do you think those nine men felt? The other three were still on top of the mountain, right? They were still on a spiritual high. They had just seen Elijah and Moses and heard God's voice. But these nine that were at the bottom of the mountain were discouraged. And they realized, are we ever going to get this? Are we always going to keep messing up? And so later, they came to Jesus, and they asked him, Lord, why couldn't we do that? We've done it before in your name. Why couldn't we do it today? And Jesus, what did he say to them? Is something really interesting, and I've never really dug into this before preparing for this message. Jesus said, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So let me ask you this question. Was Jesus praying and fasting on the mountain? We know he was praying, but there's nothing in the text to indicate that he was fasting. This kind does not go out except by prayer, by much prayer and fasting. Does it mean that when the boy's father came to the disciples and said, please, can you cast this demon out? They should have said to him, we'd be happy to do that, brother. But let us go home for for 24 hours and we'll do a, a deep fast and some deep praying and come back to us again after we have fasted and prayed. Is that what Jesus meant? No. What was it that he was talking about that can only be removed from fasting and prayer? When Jesus said this kind, he was talking about the spirit of unbelief. This kind of unbelief, this level of unbelief cannot be removed except with much fasting and prayer. And then Jesus said, it did not happen because of your littleness of faith. In Mark 9, verse 19, Jesus' first reaction after he came down from the mountain and he saw the Father in despair, he said, O faithless generation, how long do I have to be with you? You are faithless. You have no faith. You have a spirit of unbelief. And the reason why he kept stalling before casting out the demon was because he was waiting to see if anyone was showing a hint of faith in that entire crowd. The father finally got it, and that's when he cried out and broken-hearted, open-hearted honesty, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. In each one of these three stories where Jesus rebukes the unbelief of his followers, they're experiencing a crisis, right? They're in some moment of trauma when they cry out to him, The boat with the 13 men in the storm thought that death was imminent. The crisis revealed their unbelief. Peter, sinking like a stone in the Sea of Galilee, he thought that death was imminent. It was a crisis that revealed Peter's spirit of unbelief. And the father, desperate for the life, of his son, whose life was being destroyed by the power of the indwelling demon, when he cried out, it was from a place of desperation, a crisis, a trauma. And they all prayed the same prayer, Lord, save us. Lord, save me. Lord, have mercy. I do believe, help 
my unbelief. Unbelief in the life of a Christ follower often flies under the radar. Did you get that? Unbelief in the life of a Christ follower, that's you and me, my friends, often flies under the radar. We may not even know that it's there. It is unseen and undetected until a crisis occurs. And when a crisis occurs, the words that fly out of our mouths reveal what is in our hearts. And how often is a littleness of faith or a spirit of unbelief revealed through our words. We are dumbstruck when we realize that we have an attitude of unbelief. And I'm speaking from personal experience. If we want to know why there is a lack of power in our lives, we need look no further If we are weary about falling to our knees before we get into bed and praying the same, Lord, I can't believe I've done it again, prayer, every night. I thought this this life was supposed to be an abundant life, a a victorious life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can can say these words. We, We know where to turn to them in God's word. If we are experiencing a lack of power in our lives, it may be that our faith has become dwarfed because we are harboring a spirit of unbelief and it often flies under the radar. When Jesus returned to his home, his hometown, he went to his home church And he found a spirit of unbelief there, didn't he? Here he was, the Messiah, the one that these very people had been looking for their entire lives, the one that their people had been looking for for generations. He was right there in their midst. And yet when he stood among them and when he started to teach them and to speak from God's word, what did they start to do? They started to question his parentage. Well, we know who you are. You're Joseph's son. And I seem to remember that there was some question about how and when your parents were were married. We know your story, Jesus. We know your story. Who do you think you are? And in some of the saddest words ever written, in God's Bible are the words found in Matthew 13, 58. And he did not do many miracles or works of power because of their unbelief. It blows my mind. There they were. They had come to church. They were good Sabbath keepers. They didn't just have any rabbi standing up sharing the lesson with them that Sabbath. They had Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, in front of them, opening the word of life. But they harbored a spirit of unbelief, a spirit of doubt. And because they did, God's word tells us he did not do many miracles. He did not work with power because of their unbelief. What miracles is Jesus wanting to do in your life and my life? What miracles is he longing to do? Yet because of our spirit of unbelief, which we haven't even acknowledged or recognized perhaps, he can't do it. How is he waiting to work in us and through us with great powers? How is it that his hands are tied 
because we are holding on to resentment, anger, unbelief, and we don't even realize it. If this is true, that unbelief is revealed in a moment of crisis, is it any wonder then that in his great love for us, he sometimes allows his children to go through times of crisis? Sometimes going through trauma or crisis is the only way that he can get us to look deeper the only way that he can get our attention so we will examine our hearts and see what is inside. Often, we experience a crisis personally that nobody else knows about. It's a personal, private experience. Now, Peter was being watched by the other disciples, but his experience was a very personal experience of sinking below those waves. Sometimes we experience a crisis corporately in our church with our brothers and sisters, like the disciples caught in the same boat, in the same storm. This last year, 19, uh, 19, goodness, last century, <laughs> <laughs> this past year, 2020, has had us experience a crisis globally, hasn't it? We've been in a global crisis. And this past week, our country experienced a crisis. Our country experienced trauma that left us all shaken. Nobody can see those images that were being played and replayed and replayed without it impacting how you feel. And it has left us shaken, and it has left us, speaking for myself, it has left us angry. Revelation eleven eighteen says, and the nations were angry. Are the nations of the world angry? I always used to think it meant that, you know, the nations of the world are angry with each other, right? No, the people in the nations, we are angry. The world is angry. America is angry. We are angry. And yet we are not connecting the dots. Because when I am angry, what happens? What happens when I'm angry? What, ha what does the Holy Spirit do? Can the Holy Spirit abide in a place where I'm harboring anger? He leaves. And I just get angrier. And I feed it sometimes. And there is so much happening, and this anger just sits there. And when something tiny, something small, some small oversight or mistake happens, someone says something or does something, that anger is triggered, and what do I do? I unleash my anger on that person who had nothing really to do with the anger I'd been harboring. Is it just me that that happens to? Yesterday, I was in an appointment with Michael in his neurologist's office, and they had not done something that they were supposed to do, and it impacted us greatly, and I was frustrated. It was a bad week last week for all of us. I had a very heavy workload. I was exhausted. And I didn't realize how much anger was in me. And I'm very glad, thank you Jesus, that I was wearing my mask so she couldn't see the look on my face. But let me tell you, I was thinking some very unkind thoughts to the young nurse in that room. And all kinds of things were going through my mind. And I know that she picked up on my body language. She may not have seen my face. 
But I was just mad. How annoying when people are so incompetent and don't do their jobs. Says the one who often lets things fall through the cracks. We're not connecting the dots, my friends. Those disciples at the bottom of the mountain were filled with anger. They were resentful. It was very easy for a spirit of unbelief to creep into their hearts so that they could not cast out that demon. God was not able to work through those men because those men were not walking in harmony with him. And God could not bless the world through them while they held on to that spirit. We need to be like the Father. We need to connect those dots. Eventually, we come to the Lord and cry out, Oh, Jesus, I believe. Help my unbelief. Jesus wants to show us the condition of our hearts, my friend, because there's too much that flies under the radar and we think we're doing okay. And you know, as I was sitting there in the doctor's office yesterday, I marvel. I marvel at the grace and the gentleness and the tenderness of the Holy Spirit, right? Because as I was sitting there and as I was feeling this anger roiling around inside me, the Holy Spirit got my attention and said, Karen, really? You know I can't stay long if you're going to choose to hold on to this anger. And we can justify it so easily. Lord, this makes our life far more complicated because they messed up. It doesn't matter. Stop with trying to justify your anger and your rage, Karen. Confess it. And sitting there in that chair behind my face mask, I just said, Lord, I'm sorry. I don't want to drive you from my heart. I don't want to move out of this place where you abide in me and I abide in you. Because the sweetness that I have when I walk with you is not worth losing for anything or any reason. Forgive me. Forgive me. Jesus wants to show us the condition of our hearts, and sometimes he uses a crisis to do it. We have allowed a spirit of unbelief to keep us busy with infighting. We have allowed a spirit of unbelief to keep him from working with all power in our lives, changing us, transforming us, because we cannot spend time at Jesus' feet. We cannot spend time in the place of prayer without being changed. And if we are doing that and we are not being changed, we need to ask him to show us why. And it may well be because we are holding on to anger or unbelief, or some other thing. He wants to not only transform us, he wants to empower us. And we have allowed a spirit of unbelief like those disciples did to keep us from letting our lights shine in a dark, dark world. If we who call ourselves by Jesus' name struggle with this conflict and this inner turmoil, if we ourselves find ourselves in a place of anger, how much more are those in the world who don't know Jesus? How much does the world need to see the light of Christ within us? Jesus said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. As we have the light of Christ shining into us, 
that light shines through us. But if we never examine what is in our hearts, if we never confess the sin that is there, if we never spend time coming aside with much prayer and fasting to get rid of the sin in our lives, God cannot work through us to help save a lost world. And there is a song that has been going through my mind and singing its way through my heart for the last couple of weeks. Do you know that old hymn, um, Work for the Night is Coming? Work, and it, each verse traces, it starts with work in the morning when the sun is shining. Work in the noontime in the heat of the day. Work at the setting of the sun. And each, each chorus ends with work, for the night is coming when man can work no more. My friends, we will wake up one day, and that will be the end. There will be no more time to work. But while it is still day, and while we still have time, while we still have this moment to let our lights shine for Jesus, why don't we do that? Why don't we do what we need to do to get rid of the stuff that's flying under the radar in our lives? Why don't we do whatever it takes, much prayer and fasting, and examine our hearts under the microscope of prayer and God's Holy Spirit? Why don't we call on the name of Jesus as they did in each of these stories and in Jesus' name cry out with every bit as much desperation, Lord, Save me, Lord. The night is coming. We will wake up one day and there will be no more time to work. We will have given our last word of encouragement. We will have pointed the last person to Jesus and there will be no more time to work. Will we allow Christ to do his work in us so that he can do his work through us to save a lost world. My friends, spend time with Jesus. Be found in his word. Be found in that place of prayer and let him do his work in your life as I cry out to him for him to do his work in my life. Let's put aside our anger. Let's put aside our infighting and our fault finding and let us truly discover what the, discovers, the disciples discovered in the upper room. A spirit of unity, of brotherly kindness, of love, of compassion for one another. And when they did that, when they removed every obstacle and every sin with much prayer and fasting, what happened? Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit fell. And they were empowered and equipped to go out and save the world for God. The work is going to end with greater power then it began. Do you believe that? So if we're not experiencing that power in our lives now, let us commit to coming before God and falling on our faces and crying out in Jesus' name to do whatever he needs to do to bring us to that place. I want to go home. I want to go home. Jesus wants to come and take us home. Let's get serious because the time is short 
The night is coming. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? There is power in your word, Lord. And we are so busy and distracted that if we're honest, we're not spending much time with you in your word. Forgive us. Forgive us for not persevering in prayer, for pushing through our doubts until we get through it to the other side of a deeper living faith. Show us what is in our hearts and may the troubles and the crises that are swirling around us and within us reveal what is in our hearts and save us, O oh God, for your kingdom. Do your work in us and through us with power. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.